Well, hello, my lovely people. I've been <laughs> wanting to make this video for a while now. I'll uh, put myself there um, for a while now. Uh, and uh, the reason is um, I've seen what I would call a decline in this uh, amateur astronomer hobby, if we can call it, if we can call it that. So I have a number of pertinent points here regarding why you shouldn't do astro as an amateur astrophotography, that is. And um, so... You may not like some of the, what I'm telling you. Uh, you may not like it, but um, these are these are pertinent points. These are why I don't like astrophotography. I'd actually like to do it for, for example, galaxies, because I want to see the full structure as much as I possibly can. And I want to see what the equipment's capable of. So there are some there are some positive points. We want to see what the equipment can do these days. We're surprised by the amount of uh, technology that exists these days. We want to see how cheap we can get a brilliant Hubble-like photo. F fine, sure, fair enough. But is this a even astronomy or is it photography? What's your motivation? So I actually think astrophotography is actually ruining this hobby of amateur astronomy that I've been doing all my life. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Um, for starters, I it is my view that once you cross into doing astrophotography a lot and you have a, a, a full rig and all this stuff you you cross into professional territory you literally have a setup that no amateur astronomer has ever had until the 21st century for 500 400 or 500 or even 2000 years of amateur astronomy they just used a little Allardale measure the stars and they did their more advanced astronomy by calculating when the planets would recombine in terms of conjunctions and oppositions and uh, the opposite of conjunctions which is when the planets spread out and they would time this mathematically they would do this according to a calendar that was their astronomy and then I see all this so much equipment popping up in the 21st century it is beyond the imagination so i contend that once you start doing astrophotography you become a professional astronomer literally you literally have as much of equipment as a professional the only thing you don't have um, is a, a access to a massive telescope which you actually don't need now because this equipment takes <laughs> can grasp so much of the universe and in order to, to, to explain what I'm talking about, to do astrophotography, you traditionally need a proper equatorial mount in an observatory. You need to own an observatory. You need that equatorial mount. I believe amateur astronomy was not as popular in the Southern Hemisphere, and this is why I never bought an equatorial mount, because we simply don't have a pole star to point it to. So I've avoided um, equatorial mounts until these beautiful Dobsonians came out, and wow, 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 you know, just amazing. And the, the amount of equipment you need, now you can do it with a, with a, with GoTo, you only need to take uh, a digital cameras, you only need to take lots of pictures, which you can do quickly, or a video, and the computer will put it together for you. But that's another problem. That's another problem. Because you have crossed into professional territory, the equipment is doing the fun for you. That's why I believe it's better to draw. So what I'm even buying is this thing from AliExpress, uh, a little flashlight holder for the red thing. I'll attach it next to the tel on the telescope mount, and it'll just shine on my book so I can draw. Because I, I find that more interesting. I find that fun. Like how much how much can you hunt with your eyes? You're hunting. You're a hunter. How much can you hunt with your eyes to see through that lens you manually, no other equipment, and draw it? Wow. The next point, fun. Um, basically. Um, Ed Ting, I'm sure you're familiar with him. Scope reviews. I've been reading this since the 90s online. <laughs> what amazing. He is the best writer for, for telescope reviews, and people are captivated by his reviews. Now he has a YouTube channel. I think the, the writing is better than his YouTube channel, but his YouTube channel is pretty good. Um, but when you look at his uh, reviews, you find that he actually says the best telescope is something like practical, like an 8-inch dob. That is the best telescope. Uh, I believe he says that. Uh, don't come at me if he's not saying it. But by, by, it's my view that that is what he says. Because it's the one that's most accessible. He says the most accessible telescope is the one you use. It's the best telescope. It's the simplest telescope. If you need too much to set up, too much stuff, the go to all this other stuff, it, it, you're no longer using it as much. You're no longer having as much fun because you're no longer using it as much. 
in one review, it might have been of the Unitron, some 60s kids telescope or something like that. And there are some kids looking in wonder through this scope. I'm not sure what it is um, from memory. And he says, although you can't see that much through the scope, for a second you get to step into that 60s photo with those kids and having fun with that telescope. And that makes it the most fun out of all the scopes. You see? What's next? So the fun, that's the fun angle. Does it give you more fun to do astrophotography? Is that actually more fun? Or are you just pushing your scientific mind as far as you can go to see what the equipment can do, see what you can do with the equipment? And if you think that's a good thing, then think again, because what are you doing with those photos? And that brings me to another point. What are you doing with those photos? Are you being a photographer? <laughs> are you taking a pretty picture? Yeah, look, it's fine if you want to take pretty pictures, but and you want people to say, wow, look at what I can do. I'm taking these photos. Show it. These days, you get to show them on Facebook. I reckon there's more of a motivation these days to do astrophotography because you're showing those off on Instagram, on Facebook, on your websites. In the old days, you couldn't really show many people except for your friends, immediate friends, people coming into your... If you want to show off your observatory to a neighbor or something, you'd show them, oh, these are my astrophot photos I took with the Kodachrome film, you know, with my, you know, equatorial mounts and using this uh, refractor or long focus schmidt Casa grayan Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. But um, anyway, anyway. So the fun factor. The next point, complexity. The cost goes exponential. <laughs> you can literally buy a 6-inch Dobsonian long focus F8 scope, which is arguably the best telescope for practical use that you can buy these days I've seen for 500 Australian dollars 500 Australian dollars you want to go astrophotography route well you'd have to buy a tracking mount at least and it's a bit iffy regarding it maybe a SLR, you wouldn't want to use your phone, that's another $500. Then you have to have a laptop rigged up nearby, which ruins your naked eye vision, your not deep sky vision. Um, and then you need the, the inverters, battery packs, all this kind of stuff. And, and suddenly, you're doing a full-time job. <laughs> And then you need to really, you need, really need to rig up that scope. You need to switch it to a dual speeder or a digital focuser. You want to put a Telrad on it. Um, you want a fan on the back. The amount of upgrade, and, and this is just the beginning, handles on the scopes in different places, more story. The amount of upgrades you can do to a telescope is mind blowing. I've been doing it for 20 years on just one, one, one scope, and we're just doing upgrade after upgrade after upgrade. I can't believe it. Now I'm putting some plastic satchels on each side of the rocker box um, just to store the, 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 the plastic cover that you take off and you put on to store a book, an astronomy book, with uh, like Hartung's book. Hartung's book, basically. Um, so the complexity goes exponential. And when the complexity goes exponential and it turns into a job, what happens to fun factor? Let me tell you. Down. Right. Another reason you shouldn't do astrophotography is an amateur astronomy. astronomer. <laughs> you usually need a long focus telescope. And the most uh, common telescope, uh, as I spoke to you about, is the, uh, the Dobsonian for, for serious amateur astronomers where you can do some good results, um, visual results. The schmidt kessler grain as soon as you switch to this long focus scope, the long focus scopes resolve the photons a lot better for whatever reason, optics reason, and you have a lot more play in the focus. So you can get a sharper image, a lot, a lot sharper image. Um, for this reason, um, the Schmidt Cassegrains, because they've, apparently because it's got glass in it, instead of paying five hundred Australian, you're paying five thousand Australian, ten thousand Australian, fifteen thousand Australian, <laughs> and these things are heavy. Yeah, they're portable, but they're heavy. They're heavy. Ooh, and they're on an equatorial mount. Ooh, yeah, the equatorial mount's got tracking, but then you need to align it properly and all this stuff. Then you'll be wanting wanting to set up your go-to as well and all this. Okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe, or you could just use the, the old clock drive. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It's it's expensive, isn't it? And then that, we haven't touched the cameras yet. We haven't touched the cameras yet. You know. Now we'll get to why I'm I am going to do astrophotography eventually. We'll get to that, but we'll we'll touch on the motivation later. So long focus scope. 
yeah, you could use a... Now, there's two ways to go about it. You can have a long focus Dobsonian, a long focus refractor, a long focus schmidt kessler gray and or you can go down the resolution angle, which is to simply have a huge dob. That's another way of achieving that. And then you use a digital focuser or something like that, or a coma corrector or whatever. Here's another problem you don't learn to see. You don't learn to see. You don't think about what you're seeing because your brain is now the computer's brain. What you're thinking is what the computer shows you. The brain is less connected to the image. So instead of you being the amateur astronomer, you're, 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 hooking, up the, you're hooking up the machine. The machine is doing the work for you and you're almost, and you're kind of wondering, what about me? Aren't I supposed to be the one having the fun here and discovering with my eyeballs and writing it down, drawing it? Look at William Parsons, for example. This is the scientific paper of William Parsons. He built the biggest, uh, the, the world's biggest scope for decades. It was the world's biggest uh, reflector. It could only go up and down. That's called the azimuth motion. So he could only see, say, a great, <laughs> a great galaxy if it was on one of the few cl uh, clear days when it just passed his scope with the natural motion of the sky. But anyway, I'll show you this. He discovered the whirlpool galaxies and, and things, and he was drawing them. Now, to see these, what you northern astronomers can't see, for example, is the glorious, the glorious, two nearest galaxies, the Magellanic Clouds and the galaxies orbiting them, the globulars such as, um, what's it called, 47 Tucana, the greatest globular cluster there is. You can't see that. I can barely see it from the city, but I can see it, and it's good. I want to go in the countryside and do astrophotography on these galaxies just to see more about them. Maybe. Or I can just honestly just Google the pictures. Just Google the pictures on the, on a NASA website. And that's why we get down to the motivations. Why are you doing it? Have, if you're doing astrophotography, have you actually analyzed those photos? Have you said, oh, look at that star, look at that star, look, why is it doing that, why is it doing that, How, am I applying a scientific theory to this, right? And you might be saying, well, that's outside the realm of amateurs, look, fair, that's a fair point, I accept that, but you're doing more than what the amateurs used to do. You're really taking photos like a professional observatory. So I question why you're actually doing that. Do you have a theory about quasars, such as um, um, one of the electric, what was his name? I actually forget his name, but he wrote a book about quasars, and he shows there, actually, there is actually an infrared bridge between galaxies and quasars, showing current theories of quasars are wrong. Also, the electric universe, a beautiful plasma theory. I've done plasma experiments. I've shown you them on this, web, on this um, Blue Moon channel. I might up, upload some more from my uh, other channel. I'm not sure if I've got time, but, you know, just check my other channel, Charles Koss, or, uh, for, for experiments. But most of them I'm going to try and put on here. But... The electric universe is basically the future of astronomy because the conventional astronomers do not, cannot comprehend and cannot link what's happening on Earth with, with what's happening in our sun, with what's happening in the bigger picture. Plasma offers that link. And so I was thinking about photographing things just to see the plasma. You know, see how it operates. It's obviously based on electrical large laws. You can see that. It's, that's not gravitation. Um because then you'd have to have dipolar, dipolar uh, gravitational fields. And, and what's out there, what's there, nothing. It's all electrical. Um, the stars of heaven. Are you analyzing the stars? One of my favorite things to see from the city is planets or double stars. So you can see double stars from the city. Uh, one of my favorites is, um, it's just north of the pointers. It forms a triangle with the pointers. You might know what I'm talking about. If there is a white one. And there is, uh, there is a uh, an orange one, and it is the most beautiful sight, and that's that's really nice, really nice. Anyway, guys, so I've I've read all this book, I've made prolif prolific notes about stars and learning about stars. He, Pickover is the best offer, the best offer for it. If you got time, no one's got time these days. They're right, they're they're working hard, but if you've got time, Pickover is the one. Anyway, guys. Um, so I, I ask you your motivations. If you are one of these people doing astrophotography, I see a lot of you guys on YouTube. Why are you doing it? If you are just showing off, you are buying a car, a Mercedes, which is a bunch of crap, for the same reason 
as you're wanting to show off to people. I don't like that. If you're doing it to analyze your photos, yeah, look, fair enough. You, then you're demonstrating this is the dipole of the, of the say of the galaxy of the nebula. This is how the how you think the galaxy is formed according to your conventional or unconventional theories. Yeah, you, that's great. But if your motivation is something more like this is a pretty picture, I would say you're possibly more a professional astronomer, not being a professional astronomer, being a photographer. And if it's if it's photography, it's not amateur astronomy. And I, 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 I wonder, does some of this put off the amateur because they think they need to buy all this equipment? Anyway. One more point on learning to see. Um, observing Mars, you learn to see more and more if you draw it. It's currently in opposition. Check it out. It's kind of tiny and low, though. It's not a favorable opposition for the Southern Hemisphere. I'm not sure how it is in the North, but... The, the more you look at it, the more you learn. I recommend Patrick Moore's book on Mars. Really good, really good. And I recommend even one of Lowell's books on Mars. Uh, the canals are... Um, because the canals don't show up on the photography, we can't explain them as well. Are they real? Are they not real? Professional astronomers used to draw them in. What are they? Why do they uh, vary with the seasons? Why do they only show up later in the Martian season? What is their degree of physicality? These questions are things that the photographer astronomers are unwilling to ponder. Thus, science suffers, whatever science that is. Because people are saying, what's it on the photo? The computer didn't show it to me. The computer didn't generate it. So why should I talk about it? But what about what we want to know? What about that? Again, taking the human out of the equation. So uh, anyway, I'm not sure if you've enjoyed that stern lecture or not. But there you go. Your comments below. Cheerio, boys.